missing connection to your science night. Please stand by. Welcome back to another episode of the Science Night Podcast. It is in the height of spooky season. And tonight, we have some pretty creepy things to talk about. You know, we're talking about topics that are ranging from the potential end to the world as we know it, and also some creepy things with frogs. Uh, But first, let's introduce the people that are going to be talking tonight. So I am James. With me tonight is Jason. Hello. And, of course, returning champion, Steffi. Hi, I'm a champion now. This is great. It wasn't hard. It wasn't hard for you to ascend to the top. (laughs) (laughs) But we're glad you did. (laughs) Thank you. So I already touched on the two news stories we're going to talk about tonight. And we're going to finish with a conversation uh, about science policy and lobbying uh, for science in the United States. It's our conversation with Naomi Harlem Bacchus. That is going to be at the end of the episode, but first, let's get to the news. So, we have all heard about the many things that we're doing on the ground to become a little more eco-friendly, a little greener, trying to trying to hold off the world just becoming a fiery hellstorm. Uh, at least a little bit, but it becomes a lot more difficult when we talk about air travel and becoming a little bit more eco-friendly in those friendly skies that we've heard about so much. And I, I don't want to call it an article. It was really like a, really like a, an event in the National Geographic magazine that was talking about all of the many incremental changes that are being made to air travel to make it a little bit more efficient. And that's talking about things ranging from the design of the aircraft itself, the tweaking and redesign of the propulsion systems, and even changes to how we create and implement aviation fuel that can add up to potentially a significant change. I thought this was a really interesting article, and I wanted to get your takes on this because Here's the thing. I don't know that much about engineering. I know even less about aviation engineering or design. Wow. That's, that's, so I'm an engineer, not an aviation engineer. Yes. So there we go. <laughs> oh, no, Just but throwing that out there first. Engineer is good enough. Okay. You know, it's, it's exactly like when people come up to me as an, as someone who works in anatomy and tells me to diagnose their, their muscle spasms. You know, it's like, I, I can tell you where they are. That's it. It works out well, right? Huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I thought this was a fascinating in-depth article. So a, a lot of us are familiar with the green energy that's ground-based Um, Solar panels, wind turbines, electric engines, you know, for cars, high storage batteries, hydrogen fuel cells. But how do you put that on a plane? And then how do you overcome gravity with that? Um, I'm going to go back to one of my favorite tick quotes. Tick the comic. Ah, Gravity is a harsh harsh mistress. So, (laughs) Yeah. There was a quote in there about if you're going to take, let's say, let's start with lithium laptop batteries. How many lithium laptop batteries would it take to overcome gravity to get a plane in the air? 4.4 million. Especially when you can't take them on the airplane, right? You got that problem to begin with. How do you take them on the airplane and power the airplane? How do you do that? Yeah, 4.4 million of those batteries and and that's with our technology right now and that's not even accounting for how much weight that adds to the plane right so when you take into account weight that plane's not getting off the ground with battery technology right now so what do we do how do how do they overcome a problem like that right i mean um i can't imagine other than maybe fusion right (laughs) is that something (laughs) that i mean because fusion doesn't probably wouldn't weigh as much as those lithium batteries i'm guessing maybe the machinery to to uh you know keep it intact right or to keep it um 
how do I even remember what you call that? Now you're talking space propulsion right now. Right, exactly. Right. To keep it contained is the word when, I'm When you for. talk about plasma or fusion, that's, that's in space then at that point. But yeah, so um, there's a couple of things you can do. You can look at how do you engineer a plane smarter to make more efficient use of how you're um, designing the plane and utilizing that lift going through air. And then how do you use smarter fuels too? I thought the design of what they're calling the flying V, and as I actually am watching a flying V of geese fly by my window right now, as we're doing this recording, uh, <laughs> it is one of the coolest looking things that you you look at it and you're like this. I mean, right now it's a model. It's not it's not full size. They haven't scaled up, but it looks so cool. And it will obviously be included on the show notes and the website because it is just too cool to pass up. But this design uh, by Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, it kind of resembles a boomerang i guess uh is what you would say and the combination of design and the things that they're making the airplane from i don't know why my vocabulary has gotten so bad right materials now, but the, the materials <laughs> yes that's why we have an engineer here very good uh <laughs> they combine to make it 20% more efficient, which doesn't seem like a lot until you think about the other things we're going to talk about that are in the 0.1% and uh, 3% category of efficiency in increasing. So, um, Steffi, could you elaborate on, like, why this is more efficient? Um, what about just changing the way we think about what an aircraft looks like can have these profound effects? Well, going back to that, that, um, boomerang scale, if you saw the video of it in a wind tunnel, it's actually adapting to currents in the air. So it's, it's utilizing its, um, Oh, I'm losing words now, too. <laughs> it's adapting to its environment, <laughs> right? Instead of us. Sounds like you're adapting um, to your environment, some... too. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. So it's adapting to its environment. That's why I have an evolutionary biologist. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that cuts down on the amount of fuel you use if you're if you're not fighting your environment and you're actually moving through it and with it. So what struck me was that this flying V design is not really rooted in design from the natural world, right? Design's maybe not the right word. Mechanical structure is the better word, right? Not to imply any sort of designer, but um, to talk about the structure of these organisms. And so when we talk about wing structure, evolution has produced a whole bunch of very similarly shaped wings because they are the most efficient. Now, that said, there, you know, there are muscles that are you know stroking those wings in all the species that are using wings um, on the face of the earth here and so that is fundamentally different than the way a wing would need to be designed in an aircraft um, but it's still striking to me that even the airfoil design of this new flying v does not seem to be taken from earlier mechanical designs that were based on animal shapes but instead has completely reconfigured things and to me that was striking because you know, it's it's almost saying there is a more efficient way to do this. And it's sort of validating the idea that, you know, evolution's not directed by anything, right? It's just that it's tinkering with last year's model. Um, and so, you know, you can look at, say, a Ford Mustang from 1969, and it's not going to look like a Ford Mustang from 1999, right? Unless you look at all of the Ford Mustangs in between, because you can see how it changes from one design to the next by tinkering with last year's model. But Ford doesn't go back and redesign that car every single year, right? They tinker with the model from the year before. This is a complete redesign of that. And so that to me was striking. We can also take advantage of uh, recent advances in manufacturing and also improvements in materials and alloys that we have access to. So that can that can dramatically improve things and do things like reduce weight, makes it easier to make these complex shapes that we can fly through air and optimize. Uh, 
But with that means there's a lot of technological advances that we have to make, and it's not easy, easily implemented in in something like the um, aircraft industry right now. Because they pointed out that oftentimes these um, airplanes that we fly in or that are you know launched this year, they're designed and the system is set up for them to be in service for 20, 30 years or something like that. So this is really advancing technology and forward thinking, but it'll take a while for these these things like this boomerang, or there was one that's looked like a manta ray as well, um, for those to be in service, right? That was the, uh, I think they called it a sky taxi, which was even cooler. So that specific design kind of takes us on to the next overarching topic, which was changes to the propulsion system, because the manta ray looking sky taxi, if they didn't call it that, I'm calling it that now, because it's it's a... Uh, a small aircraft that is designed to hold a pilot and up to six guests, I guess you would call them. And it instead of running on a gasoline engine, it runs on a series of 36 electric jet engines, which is quite a few. <laughs> but it uh, is designed for short trips, less than 150 miles. So just quick jaunts about, about town. Uh, they said that this is as close to the Jetsons-like future that we were all promised that we may ever get. And it's really cool. And I think this is another part of the puzzle where we can't just look at one thing and think that's going to solve it. You know, the design is super important because it's like the foundation. Um, but we can look at the propulsion system and see if there's other things we can do. So this was an electric jet engine. But there were other things, too. And I, I'm going to lean on you again, Steffi. I think you're going to be way better at explaining this. I'm at the depth. <laughs> OK, so, yeah, you mentioned these these smaller, you know, air taxis. They're really limited by the battery technology. So we're getting light composite materials that allow us to build these um, small aircrafts operating on batteries. But it's really at our limit to the battery weight and capacity. So that means um, it's not ready for large scale. So what else, what other improvements can we do for things like fuel? Um, hydrogen, hydrogen fuels. People are looking at that. There was actually a demonstration in a small hydrogen fueled craft in 2008. It worked great. But then the issue becomes, and this is kind of an over encompassing issue of air travel is the climate impacts, right? So how do you process fuel even when you're doing hydrogen fuel and store it in liquid form? And for hydrogen, that's minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, how do you do that in an energy efficient way? So that's that's kind of what's holding these things up. I think that's also the case when you're talking about electric anything right now. It is really great to have an electric car, to have an electric sky taxi. But where are you getting that power from? Where yeah. is what is the grid being supplied by? So, you know, like, uh, again, I, I hate to put you on blast, Steffi, but if you get that fusion thing going. That'd be great. I, I don't know, know why, you're, why you're spending time talking to us instead of getting free <laughs> energy going. I'm working on it. Yeah, that's the thing that people neglect is great. So our cars that run on electricity, zero emissions from the car. But you really have to worry about where that electricity is coming from. So I used to live in SoCal, which was great. Everyone had solar panels there. Um, so yeah, right. you plug in your electric car and you're totally fine. You can you can run uh, you can generate enough electricity from the solar panels for your house and your car. But if you don't have solar panels, chances are you're fueling that car with fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, Indiana's got most of our um, electricity comes from coal. Right now yep. in the news, West Virginia is big, you know, is a big topic, especially with regard to Senator Manchin and um, his positions uh, about climate change policy that the Democrats are trying to put, push through right now. And so it's really interesting, right? And the, the idea here is that, you know, we're all sort of being held hostage in terms of electricity to the coal industry, but the coal industry is a dying industry. Um, and the people who are footing the bill the most are the people who live in those coal country, right? You know, Appalachia, especially. Um, they're footing the bill for all of this. And, uh, and, and yet other parts of the country, like Southern California, are able to move forward um, and are, you know, somewhat liberated from that. So I really appreciate you pointing out the solar panel aspect there from Southern California. So 
did you have solar panels when you lived in so- in Southern California, Steffi? I asked that. I know you weren't there for very long, but like um, my experience is that like they're everywhere and it's almost hard to not find them. They are everywhere. We did not have them in our house. Unfortunately, we were working on getting them and then we, we moved. But um, you'll see them on top of all buildings, parking lots. Now they're putting them in parking lots. So because the sun's always shining, your car gets hot, just park it underneath a solar panel which is awesome. They were putting them in a lot of local schools too. So it's really utilizing and taking advantage of your climate if you're using renewables and also looking at ways that it can improve your, your surroundings as well. Um, I, I, I hate to be the gloomy gust to point out like, you know, some of us live in an area where half of the year, it's just kind of like a gloom. Uh, not a lot of, of solar energy is being pulled down from those panels uh oh it is just have to move to a sunnier area they're getting more efficient um i know you can look into that and it's not always visible light i mean there's there's more to light than what you see with your eye so right it's just when you live as far north as you do james that's the issue right I think Steffi actually lives a little bit further north than me if we were to look at a map. So if she's telling me it's possible, I'm going to believe her. (laughs) Yep. We just had uh, one of my coworkers just got solar panels in their house. So sorry. No excuse for you. No. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Vermont is basically like the movie White Christmas. It's pretty much the same thing. Although climate change has made those like uh, not white Christmases much more common in, in the past year. Yeah, it's things are starting to change pretty dramatically. Um, That's why I liked when I lived in California every year, they would put out a report that would say, you know, climate change is real and this is how it's impacting around us. And this is how much of the coastline we won't have access to, like the beaches you all love in California, uh, because we're not doing anything about climate change. So. So it's interesting. California has that right. Florida on the other end of the spectrum has the same problems, right? Beach erosion is a big deal, and it's a a major consequence of climate change. But in Broward County, Florida, they've actually been able to be somewhat successful in enacting legislation that protects the beaches because they don't frame it as a climate change issue. Broward County is interesting, right? It, because it's a it's got a mix of, umi- of municipalities, right? Some of them have Democratic mayors, some of them have Republican mayors. And when it's couched as an economic tourism issue, right? Without those beaches, they're not going to be able to bring people to Florida to spend money. Then legislation can be enacted that will save the beaches, right? Um, and that includes doing things that will help combat the effects of climate change, but they can't call it climate change. So, you know, one of my colleagues, Krista Hoffman Longton here at IUPUI is often saying things to me like, you know, is it better to be effective or is it better to be right? Right. I mean, the right thing to say is this is a climate change issue. Let's enact legislation because we need to combat climate change. But maybe that's not effective. Calling it an economic tourism problem is effective and therefore it helps right? So in this case, it's definitely better to be effective than to be right. It's an interesting conundrum, right? So the same problem in Florida can be solved, but in a different way, right? People in California rally to the cause. Now that's an overgeneralization, but but typically it's, you know, um, it's a little more cut and dried, right? Different in California than it is in Florida. Yeah. I think that entire conversation is an is an incredible foreshadowing to the interview with uh, Naomi, which she talks about different tactics to talk to different politicians. So, so if any of the last five minutes, dear listener was interesting to you, you will love the second half of the show. And speaking of the tourist industry and getting people about the country, let's wrap up this story about getting uh, air travel greener by talking about the last last piece of this air air travel conundrum tripod and that is the actual fuel that goes into the engines and i thought this was really interesting because there was so many strange diabolical mad sciencey ways that they were approaching this topic i think the standout for me was the uh central georgia company called lanza tech i guess i'll buzz market lanza tech lanza tech um that 
captured carbon waste from a Chinese steel mill, and then they mixed it with microbes that were uh, originally discovered in the intestinal lining of a rabbit. And then that micro uh, microorganism ate up the carbon and turned that into ethanol, and that was added to aviation-grade kerosene to burn at a more efficient rate. That is just one of the crazy stories <laughs> from this National Geographic article. You know, they were talking about things of new and sustainable ways to grow oil seed on islands? Water? Was it just water? It was above mussels in Dubai, like just out in the salt water. It doesn't seem like it should work, but they're just kind of like finding new ways to make ethanol and then mixing it with kerosene and then putting it in airplanes. Yeah, it's great because it works and you can put it in planes now with minimal changes to the airplane itself. And importantly, too, you don't have to change what's going on in the airport. So the infrastructure is already there. You can tap into it. There's not going to be much pe many people complaining e except for the cost. Um, mm -hmm. It's about two to six times more expensive than kerosene that's used to fuel planes right now. So let me make sure I know that I have the science right on this. What they're what they're kind of figuring out is new ways to get ethanol that they can then um, enrich the aviation kerosene with. Is that seem like the accurate take on this mm -hmm. and is some of the very high cost associated with this due to them not being able to scale that process up or is there something else that is inherently expensive because a lot of it is talking about using waste products uh which i i I think that should be a cost saving. Well, some of it's done on small scale right now. So if you want to you want to do process it and, you know, do all the infrastructure around it that that comes along with this it's SAF for short, sustainable aviation fuel. Um that costs a lot of money to start scaling that process up. But you need people to buy in to get the money to scale sure. up. So it's just this chicken and the egg thing. Um, one thing that they did suggest was a solution to this could be a carbon tax, right? Mm -hmm. On kerosene. So you're, you're having the companies, you're basically helping them <laughs> or forcing them to decide, hey, this is really important for our environment. You're putting out a lot of carbon with the way you're doing things right now. So let's tax you on this um, and then we'll use that money, that percentage to help scale up this um, SAF process. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, the big picture here is that air travel is hour for hour. The worst possible thing one could do for the environment is sit on an airplane, right? Because of the carbon output. Um, yet, and, and what we learned was, you know, during lockdowns at the beginning of this pandemic, like carbon emissions dropped, right? But it didn't drop enough to make any difference whatsoever in the direction that the climate is changing and the, the pace at which it is changing. It was just super depressing because of that. Even with a carbon tax, what is this going to accomplish in the bigger picture, right? Is this, are we sort of barking up the wrong tree? Um, are, we, are we peeing in the ocean to make it rise? That's the question. <laughs> I, what I, yeah, I think like every time we talk about these things that can potentially uh, incrementally add to our fight against climate change, the one thing we're not talking about is the energy grid and manufacturing around the world that is is like you know we're talking about five percent when when we talk about commercial aviation, we're not talking about eighty five percent, which is the energy grid and industrial manufacturing uh, that we just kind of, you know, other other than heroes like like Dr. Steffi Deem that is trying to change the world through fusion energy, um, we just we don't really talk about that stuff. You know, we talk about how electric cars are great, but we don't talk about how how entire areas of the world have been decimated to get the minerals that are used to make the batteries or the uh, coal that is burned in West Virginia. Uh, or the people so that, that die to get the yeah. coal, right? Mm -hmm. And to get the oil. There's a lot of people that die mm -hmm. or ha or get sick mm -hmm. from this process just to get energy, right? 
So to answer your question, Jason, like, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff to look at. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Right. I think what's clear is that hour for hour, the worst thing that we could be doing to the environment is keeping Dr. Steffi Deem from figuring out how plasma and fusion is going to work, right? I don't sleep. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're just running on running, running on, on energy. Uh, uh, cobalt and <laughs> cesium today. Yeah. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so I think one of the most interesting parts of this fuel thing was the use of algae to create the ethanol that they were using to make one of these SAF enrichments, mm -hmm. which brings us to our next story wow that was a seamless transition that was Smooth. beautiful that, one. That, that was, was beautiful mm -hmm. right <laughs> yeah oh man let me let me let me bring the voice down an octave for That's this right. what we're going to talk about next could be troubling to young viewers this is the first installment in something that uh co-host jason oregon likes to call the weird science and what <laughs> we're doing is highlighting strange applications of the scientific method and asking ourselves not can you do this but why would you think to do this in the first place mm -hmm. our first story dear listener <laughs> comes to us from the ludwig maximilian university in munich germany because of course it comes from germany i mean let's be real this could only have come from the minds of a german biologist what these people have done, uh, let, okay, let's not beat around the bush. They injected cyanobacteria and algae into a tadpole, let it perfuse the bloodstream of the tadpole, and then they killed the tadpole by reducing the oxygen level in the water around it. And that could be the end of the story until... They literally shined a light onto the dead tadpole to see what would happen. And the cyanobacteria and algae converted that light into energy, emitted oxygen as a waste product, and reperfused the brain tissue of the dead tadpole, and brain activity started again. All of those things are incredible. How do you think this is a good idea to start with? That's the question, right? It's not like, how does this work? This is all kind of basic. If you think about, like, we know that photosynthesis creates oxygen. And I guess, like, if oxygen is going to be in the blood, it's going to be in the blood. What makes you think, I need to try this? Because it's amazing. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is how the best scientific discoveries happen right and it's funny because then they become part of mainstream right i mean for example we know that uric acid denatures dna it pulls the proteins and dna apart right uric acid is the major component or one of the major components of urine who thought to do that who thought to try to use urine to denature dna right i don't know the answer to that I don't know that I want to know the answer to that or even the story surrounding that. It was probably as simple as, I have this jar of uric acid, maybe this will work, right? Because oftentimes, that's how science progresses. When I first got to Indiana University, we were, I was collaborating with a lab that was looking at a particular drug that was being used to treat osteoporosis. And it was doing it in a way that other osteoporosis drugs don't work. So um, there are sort of two basic types of drugs that are used to treat osteoporosis. There are ones that traditionally, there are ones that um, sort of stop the turnover of bone. So they stop the bone cells that, that consume bone and eat it out. So bone's a really interesting tissue because it's constantly turning over. So every time you walk, you induce these little micro fractures in your bone. Uh, and then cells in your bone tell other cells, hey, come in here and eat this out. And we're going to you know, put this put new bone down here and make the bone strong again, right? And we're going to get rid of that little micro crack. It's fascinating. Well, osteoporosis drugs can um, work by either stopping those, those what are called osteoclast cells, the ones that consume the bone um, from, from consuming bone, or they can build bone and they can sort of induce another 
type of cell called an osteoblast to lay down new bone. So you can sort of work both ends of that. Well, this new drug that we were looking at, which has since, you know, been used quite extensively to treat osteoporosis, but when I first got here, it was, you know, relatively new still, trying to figure out the mechanisms of how it worked. Turns out that rather than stopping bone cells from eating bone or laying down new bone, um, what it does, what it uh, does is it increases the hydration in the bone. But nobody really understands why. That's actually a good question that still is not answered. But they figured it out just by taking some bones and throwing them in a Petri dish with the drug and leaving them there for a few days and realizing that even though these bones were dead tissue, something still was happening to them that they were then tougher when we broke them in mechanical testing, um, which is a property that tells you how well a bone or any material can withstand the propagation of a crack once it's initiated, right? And so the tougher a material is, and Steffi probably knows this way better than I do, the tougher a material is, the less likely it's going to continue to rip as that crack is running through. Um, it's going to resist that a little bit more. And so this drug it makes bone tougher by increasing the hydration how that works we don't know right but again just somebody said why don't you throw those bones in a petri dish and see what happens and that's what they did it's crazy stuff i'm sure there's much more interesting things that have happened in dr deem's lab because you know i she did use a phrase earlier uh referring to vaporizing metal um I mean, which yeah. was just so nonchalant right it's like ah, eh, it's just a bunch of vaporizing metal small fires um you just throw a th bunch of power and current through metal and you can just vaporize it, turn it into plasma. But but can she bring a frog back to life? No. That is the real question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that if you were to put a tadpole next to vaporized sublimated metal, uh, it would definitively not come back to life. Mm -hmm. It would be as dead as one could possibly be, correct? It, I mean, you could vaporize that, too. Have you, have you vaporized? A, uh, is this when you... I mean, never. it never happens on purpose, right? When you're operating high-power <laughs> electronics, sometimes, like, bugs get in there. Things like that. It happens. Mm. True. We've it's all natural. seen video of, like... Of an airplane having to shut down an engine because a bird flew in it, right? Yeah. Mm, true. Right? It's exactly the same thing. So, uh, okay. Let's, <laughs> I have a exactly question about this tadpole. Okay. So this is amazing, yeah. right? Bringing it back amazing. to sure. life. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what does that mean? Like, how can you apply it to maybe humans or beyond this, this tadpole head in a dish? I thought about that too. And like the application I came up with is only applicable if you can figure out a way to get light within a human skull. Because one of the problems we do have quite a bit with um, ischemic injuries, injuries where the brain has been deprived of oxygen, is something called a reperfusion injury, which is mm -hmm. you have oxygen rush back into that area and it's actually um slightly it's it's bad for that area for a little bit of time and there's like the thought that if you can slowly get oxygen into that area it could increase the um potential for recovery and it seems like this was a pretty slow process because the cyanobacteria just kind of like created oxygen on it at it, at its own speed and mm -hmm. um eventually the the amount of oxygen in the area increased over time now the caveat is like do we put like a ma do we cut a hole with a mag light um like I, I that's where i don't know <laughs> clearly it's a ring light that we need right oh, it could that would <laughs> right yeah no it's it's amazing right that we can use that we could potentially use photosynthesis to repair vertebrate animal tissues right that is mind blowing, um, but you're right. It, you know the reason that works in these tadpoles is because they're translucent. You can shine a light in there and get those cyanobacteria to start to photosynthesize. So what you're saying is we need to find a way to turn our skin translucent. And That's bone. correct. And bone. And bone. Right, baby steps. Right. Let's start with skin. <laughs> 
<laughs> and skin and bone come from similar derivatives, and so it shouldn't be that hard to manipulate it somewhere down <laughs> early on, right? The question is, how do you deal with it once you're a fully adult? So maybe yeah. the applications are, you know, early on, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> I'm, no, I'm actually being dead serious now. Um, that like maybe I, the applications for this would in humans would be oh, more I useful see. early on in embryogenesis, right? So I when thought you were talking about like affecting the translucent nature yeah. of skin and bone at an earlier age. That's <laughs> what I thought too. <laughs> I mean, that is also true, right? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm less that's horrified. Not what I was, Continue. Right, that, I understood. I get where uh, that was. I see now why there was this horrified look on your face. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I think maybe earlier on in in you know in the differentiation of fetal cells, like if you know that there's a problem that is related to an oxygen deprivation um, issue, mm. that maybe mm-hmm. you could could get in there and do that, right? And that would require you know removing. We're talking really sci-fi stuff here, but removing fetuses, treating a fetus, putting it back into a uterus, right? Reimplanting. That's I don't think we're there yet, but but you know, as we were talking about earlier, when these kinds of small, unique, weird things happen, they actually identify a series of steps then that need to occur in order to get there, right? And to get to make that useful. And that is actually what's interesting about the scientific enterprises, right? It's all of these sure. isolated small discoveries and then pulling them together and saying, okay, if we can harness this discovery, um, you know, by getting three or four discoveries down the road, um, then we've actually got something that's actionable um, as opposed to um, an interesting curiosity, and in the in the interest of full disclosure, so that this can be repeated, they use the tadpole stage of an African clawed frog, uh, in which they injected green algae and cyanobacteria. You can read this entire article, and I recommend that you do, in the journal Eye Science, which is not one I've heard of, but I mean... They got a lifelong subscriber now after they ran this article. Let's see what else they got going on. (laughs) All right. We are at the point where we are going to head to a quick commercial break. When we get back, our conversation that I teased earlier with Naomi harlem she's going to talk about science policy and how she convinces the many different wheels of American democracy to fund the sciences. All that will be in your ears after this quick break. Can you hear me? Do you smell the foul corruption? Things get a little strange here. And what about me? Like, really strange. Grotesque stench of rotten flesh. Yet consider this an invitation to our humble podcast. I'm only just starting. Just search, and we'll be waiting to greet you with a big... Hello. Come here. And welcome to Pulp from Beyond the Veil. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Naomi Harlenbachus. She is a senior science policy analyst for the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, which is a coalition of 29 scientific societies collectively representing over 130,000 individual biological and biomedical researchers, including me and James. Dr. Harlan Bacchus, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I I love this opportunity. It's great to be here. We are so excited to talk to you today about the efforts that you lead at FASEB in the Animals and Research and Education Working Group, where you develop policy statements, you track congressional legislation, uh, and agency directives related to animal use in federal research, and you create resources for lab animal community. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means exactly? Why is animal research so important? Yes. No, I love that question. It's a touchy subject, actually, animal research, uh, the use of animals. You get a lot of mixed mixed feelings about it in the community. But I think that COVID-19 pandemic really illuminated the need for animals in research more broadly. But my job specifically is really helping to advocate for the humane and ethical use of animals in research. And I do a lot of myth busting. So it's a lot of like scientists don't, you know, have their 
speakers and their lab coats on and are their mad scientists in the lab and, and they harm animals on purpose. You know, there's a lot of regulations and a lot of hoops that scientists have to jump through in order to start their research. And, and then throughout the research study, there's a lot of checks and balances that go with it that a lot of committees have to make sure that they are doing what they said they would be doing. They're treating the animals with respect and the appropriate care. Veterinarians are watching them around the clock. So I have to really shed light on that issue because many people, especially non-scientists, don't understand that and then really help to make a relevant example of how animal research has created so many biomedical advances that we enjoy today. So the pharmaceutical drugs that you see over the counter in the supermarket, the fact that you can get insulin now, you know, those with diabetes are rely on insulin. That all came from animal research. So it has to start somewhere. And we know how important science is, but what are the models and the resources that they, that they use in order to get to those answers to the questions that we have? So I love this idea of myth busting. And one of the things that James and I are very passionate about, especially in this podcast, is making sure that the public can understand what it is that scientists do. So we you know, try to help scientists tell their science story a little bit better. Can you give us some examples of some of the myths that you have busted for the public with uh, you know, surrounding animal research? Because that sounds like uh, a, a place where a lot of people might get tripped up. Yeah, yeah. So one of ones that I hear a lot actually are, well, I don't want, you know, scientists taking my pets and and just using it for the lab, which is just completely false. So the Animal Welfare Act was actually put in place to prevent that from even happening. So it's illegal to just take pets. Actually, scientists have to breed specific animals for research. So they're specifically bred for research purposes. So pets are always off limits. Um, and that's the reason why that law is in place since 1966. Uh, other other common myths that I hear is that the researchers don't care about the animals and the animals are not well cared for. People don't, quote, care so much about rats and mice uh, specifically, but even from rats and mice up until our companion animals, uh, dogs and cats and, and hamsters, they are all receiving the amount of care and the level of training that you would receive if you can even touch a mouse. So I, when I was in grad school, before I could even touch a mouse and start any kind of surgery, I had to go through so many trainings to just make sure that I knew what I was doing. And then I had someone watch me before I could even start a process and then make sure I was doing it correctly. Um, so those are two of the biggest misconceptions that I hear a lot. And then a lot of people assume that we don't need animal research in general, that you have a lot of non-animal alternatives like organs on a chip or computer simulations, that those are fine to substitute the level of, of animal research and you don't need animals at all. And that's just not true. I think we should be listening to the scientists more and that's where I come in to try to bridge that knowledge gap. But the fact of the matter is, is that science is just not where it needs to be quite yet. Like for some research questions, maybe you can use an organ on a chip to answer that question. But those alternatives only provide you a sliver of information in time. You can't look at the whole body in general because it's not a whole body. It's just like one organ at one point in time. So that's, you need the entire physiology of an animal to really replicate these complex processes and mechanisms and really understand how basic science even works and then how a disease works. So those are a lot of the things that I keep hearing over and over, both on Capitol Hill and just within the general public. You know, you actually may raise a really interesting point here, and that is the sort of rigor with which or scrutiny under which these animal protocols have to be approved. In my experience, as someone who has done both research on people and research on animals, it is always harder to get research approved for animals than it is for people, because like you said, animals can't give informed consent, and so there is a lot of protection for those animals. And then back to your point about why are there not alternative models, as someone who studies bone and muscle, I literally cannot use anything other than bone and muscle, and the way that you have to you know, the way that, that that is done is with the use of, of vertebrate animals. Can't use an invertebrate to study bone because they don't have bone. And so it's hard to do that, right? You can't study a cell, a single cell, because it's not behaving the same way that a tissue of cells would behave. And the tissue is not going to behave the same way that a whole animal is going to behave. And so you have to sort of, you know, build up from the smaller to the bigger. And uh, it's important to do that. So 
how did you get involved in changing policy or at least affecting changes in policy? I mean, it seems like a far skip and a jump from the laboratory to Capitol Hill. So how did you make that transition? Because uh, I'm sure our listeners would, would love to know about alternative careers to that you know, bench science academic researcher that many of us were molded to become because our supervisors during our PhDs wanted us to become the next generation of them. Yeah, I love that question. I, and I get it a lot. And I, I started grad school thinking that I would ultimately become a professor and, you know, have my own lab and continue research forever and ever. And I quickly realized that I did not want to do the lab forever. I enjoyed the research, but there are Work-life balance is very important to me, and I just didn't see that playing into that. And I think that's a whole other podcast that we could talk about, you know, how we should promote work-life balance within grad school. But I was like, well, I, I just don't think this is a sustainable lifestyle for me. So I was like, what are my other options? And I had to be really honest with my mentor and say, I love the work that I'm doing, but I don't know if I could do it full time. Are there other ways I could use a PhD in science and make an impact in the world? Because I really do want to contribute and, and make a difference somehow. And his eyes kind of lit up and he was like, actually, like policy and advocacy is a great avenue for you. You're, you're a people person. You, you love to learn and you're, you're a go-getter. I think you'd be great for it. And I didn't even know that was an option. So the fact that my mentor really opened that door to me really helped me pursue it. And from then on, you know, it was a balance. I had to really keep working on my dissertation project and, and make sure I was doing my work in the lab, but then also pursue other activities that were policy and advocacy related. But he was a big cheerleader in that, and I really needed that support. And I know that's not common. A lot of mentors and PIs are very much like, no, you have to stay in academia and stay in the lab. And that just can be so hard on graduate students. Um, and I have advice on that in, in general. But one opportunity that he brought to me was, well, he said, first, you need to go to a Capitol Hill day. Just see if you like it. See if you like talking about your research in small snippets to a non-scientific audience and, and see if you just enjoy that atmosphere. I did, and I loved it. Then I came back and he said, okay, let's see if you can do it for just longer than one day. You know, you need to figure out, do you want to do this full time? So he pointed me to an internship opportunity with Research America, which is a nonprofit and, and like an alliance of a different member society. It's kind of like FASIV. And so he actually gave me permission to take three months off. And I, I went to D.C. I did that internship. I, I went to Capitol Hill every day. I monitored the budget process. I learned all the ins and outs of science policy. And I was like, do I have to come home? I don't want to, I don't want to leave. I really, really like this. He's like, well, now you know what career you want, like come back and finish and then let's go after it. So I came home, um, finished up all my work and, and then I just, I kept staying plugged into science policy. It's really important to build up your resume and stay active to make sure that potential employers see that you really are serious about policy. So that's that's a little bit about, you know, my career path. And then ultimately, when I graduated, I I had met my now boss at a networking opportunity and I saw she was hiring. You know, she remembered my name and that really got my foot in the door. And, and here I am. So the rest is history. So in the in the interest of full disclosure, I actually have met your Ph.D. supervisor at a Capitol Hill day. Um, which is how I came to, to meet you. And so what is interesting to me is that you had a supervisor, you keep referring to him as your PI, for our audience that doesn't know what a PI is, that stands for Principal Investigator. Um, that's the person who usually runs the laboratory uh, and trains the PhDs and the postdoctoral scholars. Your PI was very supportive of this idea that you were interested in an alternative, what they call an alternative career in science, even though it's really Maybe that's a misnomer for it. Do you, have you heard many stories of, of non-supportive PIs and how people have overcome that? I'm sure you've spoken to lots of groups. I'm sure you've spoken to lots of students who are interested in this as a potential career path, but don't have that support. What kinds of advice do you have for those listening who might be interested in a career like this, but don't have that support system like you did? Yeah, it's so hard. And it, it breaks my heart when I hear about it. But one thing I will say, and, and I've talked to a lot of individuals, even in grad school, a lot of people really wanted to get involved. Um, when I came back from my internship, I wanted to plug into a science policy group at the university and really just stay active in that, that realm. 
but there was no such group. So I was like, okay, I'll start one. <laughs> so I and a couple others that really wanted to, to engage in this started a science policy and outreach group. And a lot of people came to me and said, look, I really want to participate. I want to do the activities. I want to go to Frankfurt, Kentucky, which was our capital and, and go to Capitol Hill Day, but my PI won't let me. And it just, it broke my heart. And so one thing I really do urge um, individuals, if, if they're listening to this, that they are, are not getting that kind of support, is to try and find a mentor outside of the labs, someone that you can talk to and go to and, and run these opportunities and get their feedback. Since they're in academia, maybe they can provide some insight. Maybe they can even talk to your PI. And I know how hard that conversation is, but getting over that hurdle and just saying, listen, this these are my career goals. This is what I want to do. How do I get there if I don't have the support? And sometimes it's even beneficial to have a mentor that's outside of your own lab in general, just to get that outside feedback. Uh, so that would be the first thing I would say. And then I would say, go ahead and keep building up your resume, even if you don't have that support. You know, I know it's free time and grad school is very limited. Uh, but really, one big thing you really need to make it into policy is you have to have good writing skills. And it's not science writing. You have to make sure you know how to write for a non-scientific audience. So practice those skills. Practice writing letters to the editor. Practice writing op-eds to your local newspaper. Uh, and try and get them published if you can. But a lot of these op-eds and these letters to the editor, they have a limitation on words. And you can only write 250 words. But that forces you to, to practice how to write very direct and succinctly, which is what all of policy is. So if you can get into that rhythm and have good writing samples when you do apply for a job, that is your ticket in because we get a lot of applications even now when we interview people and they don't have the writing skills and you kind of gloss over them. Uh, so that's my biggest piece of advice is find a mentor and then practice your writing. That's some great advice. Um, and I really especially like the practice your writing for the non-specialist because you know one of the things that, that we all are, are guilty of is writing at the level that we're comfortable writing because we're using the language that is very specific. It's very jargon-filled, um, and it's meant to make a point as quickly as possible with as few words as possible. Well, sometimes what you need to do is, is write with more words that are more descriptive but maybe aren't as specific as the scientist would use because not everybody has that same lexicon, not everybody has that same vocabulary, and it's impossible for you to predict what your audience knows you should just make sure that you tell them what it is they need to know. So we've both now mentioned Capitol Hill Day. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what that is and how you're involved in that on a regular basis and why we should all be involved in it? Yes. No, I love Capitol Hill Day. And I think a great way to get started is to, if you have a scientific society like, like AAA and even FACIP has their own Capitol Hill Day, is connect with staffers on your scientific society and ask them, how can I get involved in Capitol Hill Day? So that's step one. Capitol Hill Day itself is where you go at, on behalf of a scientific society and you go and advocate for increased biomedical funding research and other various issues. So FACIP often talks about animal research and the role of animal research in biomedical funding. So we want this amount of money for NIH because we need sustained increases to the NIH budget to really make sure that we can not only compete on the global stage, but also make sure that we can meet the needs of the American people. And then we also advocate for NSF and DOE because they all have are really critical players in the science landscape. So you go to Capitol Hill Day and everyone has, you have your own representative within your district. So everyone has a representative in the House. And then you also have a senator. There are two senators per state. And then the House of Representatives, it just depends on how big your state is. It's based on population. And every little place where you live is a, is a district and you have your own representative. So you typically are hooked up with those offices, whoever you represent. And that's key because people on the Hill, they don't want to hear from me that's, you know, representing a, a D.C.-based organization. They want to hear from their constituents because that's where the votes come from. So if you go into that office and say, I have these concerns, I would like this happening on at the federal level, they'll listen. So if we have scientists coming in saying, listen, I work at this institution, which brings your state a lot of money, 
I need more funding for this because I'm studying this disease and this disease affects this many people uh, and really lay it out for them and show them how how important it is to fund my biomedical research and to keep sustaining that funding. So that's a little bit about Capitol Hill Day. And it's it's a big day where you just go from office to office talking the same old talking points. And you'll hear a lot of practicing your elevator speech, which is pretending like you are stuck in an elevator with a senator or congressman and in 30 seconds or less, talk about your research. If you're able to do that, you will do well on Capitol Hill Day. But it's hard. It's hard to summarize your research and everything that you do and the importance of it in 30 seconds. But that's a skill that I think everyone, if you want to get interested in policy, really needs to master. I love what you say there, Naomi, and uh, I completely agree with you. It's important for all of us to be able to tell the non-specialist what we do in language that they can understand. To that, I want to add, though, that, you know, it may be difficult to explain your research in a short amount of time with clarity, but it's even harder to make someone care about what you do. And so what we've been trying to do here at Indiana University and what I'm hoping that James and I are going to be able to do a little bit with this podcast is demonstrate how putting yourself in your science makes you more personable and makes you more empathetic and you can attract an audience better that way. You can get someone's attention if you explain things like why you became passionate about what you do because then they'll want to hear more. I love this, and I'm so grateful that you are involved in organizing all of this. How can folks who are interested get involved? You know, I had to be invited by my organization to represent the organization at Capitol Hill Day. If I am not someone who was fortunate enough to get some sort of invitation like that, but I'm interested in this, how can I get involved? Yeah, that's a great question. And every scientific society has different rules on who can come. So I would say your first stop needs to be like contact your scientific society staffers and say like, can I learn more about Capitol Hill Day? Is there a way that I can get involved? So the first way that I got involved is is my PI was invited and then he kind of I don't know. He's he like twisted some arms and he said she's coming with me. So that was like one way that I was able to go. But then I really wanted to continue doing it. And with the Society for Neuroscience, which was my scientific society, I became a early career policy ambassador. I represented the state of Kentucky. And through that fellowship, I was able to go to Capitol Hill Day on behalf of SFN. So it could be that your scientific society has those opportunities and you can go um, through that. But I would say to get more information, go to your scientific society. Uh, like FACET, for example, we, we open it up to our member societies and then they contact people like yourself, Jason, and, and you then become invited. So it's a little right. different. It's just because you don't want like a mob of people because if everyone came, then the meeting would not be effective. And people on the Hill have a very short attention span, so you can really only have like a meaningful conversation if it's just a few people in the room, unfortunately. In the pandemic, it's even harder through Zoom because sometimes they don't even have their camera on, which is just makes it even less personable. I think everyone's a little bit cautious about mobs on Capitol Hill these days anyway, so I understand, right? Okay, so you go to Capitol Hill, you advocate for you know an increase in funding for the NIH. How does that make a difference to society? Can you give us some examples of the policy work that you've done, the advocacy that you've done, that have actually made a a difference in someone's life down the road or is on the path to do that? I would love to hear how you've affected change. Yeah, that's a really good example. So it's not even just Capitol Hill. So I have to actually even monitor NIH policy, OSPP policy, which is the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy. So they are like even above Congress. You know, Congress really goes to OSPP and says, we're looking to you for science advice. Tell us where to go. So we have to monitor all kinds of meetings and really beef up our advocacy to make sure that science is is on par, uh, not only with the rest of the country, but making sure we meet the needs of people on the ground. One thing that really jumps to mind for me is that, and going back to animal research, is one thing that we really advocate for is robust and continued funding for non-human primate research. So non-human primates, you know, your monkeys that are often located in these big institutions, but also we have primate centers located throughout the U.S. And NIH supports those centers, and they do a lot of the research themselves. And a lot of vaccines, including the COVID-19 vaccine, was developed because we had non-human primate research. 
Um, one thing that really over the years, because we continued advocating for increased funding for NIH, as well as animal research funding, is sickle cell anemia. So there was promise just a few years ago, thanks to an infusion of funds for the NIH, um, that they found what they think could be a therapeutic and, and a cure for sickle cell, uh, and sickle cell disease. With that research, there was just a few years ago, the first successful treatment of a patient in clinical trials at the NIH. So we were able to see from the very beginning the basic research that NIH started funding through R01 grants and other mechanisms that researchers use to really fund their research. And then it moved on through the clinical pipeline to non-human primate studies all the way up to humans that now Francis Collins even declared just a couple years ago he thinks we have a cure for sickle cell disease. And that's just, that's amazing to see, but it takes years. And that's why we have to go to the Hill and we have to go to NIH all the time and say, sustained increased funding will allow us to open the door and, and find cures for other numerous diseases. And that's Francis Collins, the head of the National Institutes of Health, correct? Yes. Excellent. That's exciting stuff. You had a hand in, in that because you have been advocating for the importance of non-human primate research. Right. Um, and helping to affect that change. That is fantastic. Any other examples that you want to talk about? Because I know you've got several. You've, you've told me yeah. about them, many of them in the past. Yeah. So th one of my favorite examples was, it was right before the pandemic, OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, they have every year what's called like a, a meeting with their presidential council of advisors on science. So, And it, this started back in the Obama administration. And it's just, you know, scholars from across the country come together and they advise on, on all kinds of matters. It's not just basic science. It's how is our trainees and our graduate students doing? How can we make sure that the next generation of scientists can really propel the nation forward? So they talk about everything and we really monitor that meeting closely. So I went to that meeting. Um, it was fascinating going to the White House and like going through all the security. It was so much fun. And I, I sat through that meeting, and it's, it's a bunch of well-known, established investigators, and they were all talking, including the OSCP director, which was at the time Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer, and they were talking about, we want to make sure that we, we help trainees, and we make sure that they are, are in a good position to start their careers and, and continue science. And I'm sitting there, and it's a, a bunch of you know older people, and I was like, we're talking about trainees, and there's not a single trainee at the table. Like... Don't you want to hear from the actual graduate students that are, are working on this, who you're talking about? So I came back. I was a little frustrated, and I, I went to my boss. We went up the chain, and I said, what if we wrote a letter to OSTP and said, create a committee that is specifically just trainees, you know, graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, so that they can advise you guys on how to move forward? What are they seeing? What are their their problems and their concerns that we at the federal level can really help impact change. And they said, yeah, sure. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but try it. So I wrote that letter. It was distributed and sent to Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer's office. And then about three weeks later, there was an announcement that said they created a committee that was just trainees. And I was like, we did that. We actually did that. Like, that's how, that's, I think, to my mind, the biggest way that you can, as a scientist working in policy, can help create change. That is such a great story. And it's really inspiring because, you know, most of our earliest career members of our disciplines are the ones who are most vulnerable, and they don't often have that voice. And so you've empowered them. Um, and that's just really a, a really cool story. You've now had an opportunity to work across three different presidential administrations in this area. How have um, you know, changes in, in administrations affected your day-to-day -day work? How have things changed from Obama to Trump to Biden? Right. So, so it's, it's difficult. So we went from a Democrat to a Republican to a Democrat. And it's actually funny, but with Democrats, there's actually more work to be done because Democrats actually like regulation, and they like to impose more rules, which then means they ask for more public comments. So they put out what's called requests for information, or for short term, we call it RFIs. And a lot of times they'll post, you know, hey, we want to hear from the community. What are your thoughts on this? Um, how should we improve this? There's actually a lot more proactive policy change in the Democratic administration versus the Republicans that actually want to cut back on the red tape and make it easier to just, you know, less hoops to jump through. 
But at the same time, the Trump administration imposed a lot of other different difficulties that, you know, we really didn't see coming. So a lot of times with the Trump administration, we were constantly refreshing the news and wait a second, that that's going to cause this problem. And we need to put out a statement saying this is not good. So we, it was a lot of like pivoting with the Trump administration just because we didn't know what day was going to bring what. But it's a little bit more status quo with the Democrats, uh, but it's still a lot more work. So people are like taking a sigh of relief with the Biden administration, and rightly so, because he's very pro-science and we are very excited about that. But it's a lot of work on the policy front that we want to make sure that there's a lot of if there's the necessary checks and balances and that they're making sure that they are taking into consideration the concerns of the scientists before they put into place any change. Right. Your point about regulations versus non-regulations and Democrats versus Republicans is an interesting one. Um, and I wonder how much of the pivoting that you had to do during the Trump administration was really just because it was such an atypical Republican administration and whether it would have been just a little bit different had it been any other Republican or more mainstream Republican or someone with a little more experience in the political realm. You know, I'm sure that that was a cause for headaches on, on many occasions. Just the, the constant sort of pivoting, trying to figure out what, you, what the day was going to bring, what new things were going to cause, what new problems. That's really interesting. So the last question I want to ask you is something that I want to ask everybody who comes on the podcast. And the reason I'm asking this is because we want to get to know you as a person, not as a scientist. So Tell us about something that you are very passionate about that is not related to science. How can we get to know Naomi Harlembakis, the person? Yeah, I love that question. Uh, that's a really good one. So, I mean, my first, the first answer that comes to my mind is that I just love reality TV, and I could watch a lot of reality TV. So if you guys have a reality TV <laughs> suggestion, I probably already watch it. Do you have a favorite one? I mean, am I allowed to say The Bachelor? I know it's terrible. My, like, if my boss is listening to this, she's like, oh, my gosh. I can't believe she just said that. But yes, I love The Bachelor. Um, and then all kinds of other, you know, it's just ter- it's just mindless TV that I can use to really like kind of unwind because my job is very like got to read a lot, got to analyze a lot. Um, it's just kind of like my husband will like never forgive me for saying it. But he's like, when we have kids, you are not watching this. <laughs> but the other thing that I would say, which is a little bit more acceptable, but now it's out there, is that I'm very passionate about um, advocating for positive body image and an eating disorder awareness. I had an eating disorder since I was 12 years old, and it, you know, a lot of ups and downs uh, throughout grad school. And that's why I think mental health is really important in grad school, making sure you have that work-life balance. Uh, But because my weight was not where it needed to be, and I really struggled with that, I'm very sensitive to people that really struggle with loving themselves and being confident in themselves. I've been there. I know it's really hard, and I struggle with it, too, sometimes. Like, I don't like everything about myself. I always see the flaws. Um, But I want to make sure that people just love who they are completely and, and be unapologetic about it. You know, that who you are, you know, you deserve to have a voice and, and just take space in this world and whatever you put your mind to, that you can do it with the right support system. That's something I, I try to raise awareness about because I think eating disorders, despite being the number one with the highest mortality rate in all psychiatric diseases, we don't really think about it as much because we tend to think about obesity and, and the overweight problem, which is just as much of a problem. But there's also an, another problem that I think a lot of people forget about and it's just kind of fl- flies under the radar. Right, right. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I know that you've written a little bit about that. So maybe we can share if you have a couple of, of pieces that you're particularly proud of that we could share those in the show notes for this episode. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because, because again, we want to give you an opportunity to spread your passion for that as well here. And it's really an important message. All of the messages that you have given us today have been really important. And we're really grateful, uh, Naomi, that you that you came on to speak with us today. I wish you the best of luck. And thank you so much for coming on to Science Night. Thank you so much. This is so much fun. Thank you to Naomi for sitting down and talking with us. Who knew how much finesse was used in getting politicians to do what you asked them to do? Uh, An amazing conversation. Thank you so much. You can find out more about what she's doing by following the links on our website or in these show notes. That is going to end this incredible episode. Another instant classic. Put it up in the rafters. My name is James Reed. And if you want to follow me, 
you're going to want to head over to twitter.com slash James underscore read and then the number three. Jason, where can people find you and follow you? You can also find me on Twitter at Oregon JM. And Steffi, tell them where to find you. You can find me also on Twitter at Steffi Deem. If you want to find out more about this very podcast, go to Night. Dot com and follow us on Twitter. We're trying to be way more active on there. So find all that good stuff we're doing at Science Night and the number one. That is going to do it for this episode. We will be back with a special bonus Halloween episode in one week's time. I cannot wait for you to hear what we are coming up with. That's going to be out next week. And until then, have a great night. The Science Night Podcast is a proud member of the River Power Podcast Mill. To find out more about our shows, go to riverpower.xyz. Jason. That was odd. There you are. I agree with you. I didn't even mute it. Um, I I'm keeping that in, by the way. <laughs> I'm totally keeping Here that we are. <laughs> I love it. Here we are, you know, 18 months into a pandemic and everyone finally uses Zoom and I'm the one who forgets to unmute myself. Right? Um <laughs>